So you haven't finished eating, please keep, keep eating, but I will um, do the formal introductions of our, our two speakers for this morning. So they're actually doing a double act, so they're going to have two people to, uh, to focus on up the front here, but Alex Lease from Cox. Alex is an associate with Cox Architecture with 15 years' experience working in Australia and the UK. He's worked in many major sectors of the building industry, from residential, health, retail, civil, sports, stadia, delivering high-quality high complex projects. In recent years, Alex has been involved in the design delivery of a number of uh, complex projects, including the National Maritime Museum in China, if you've seen that, it's an amazing-looking building, the Anamir's Velodrome we're about to hear about, and currently working on the North Queensland Stadium in, in Townsville. Alex has a strong interest and, and experience in developing um, parametric design systems that can, be, can provide great design flexibility whilst achieving high efficiencies. Our second speaker is Alastair Hall from Arabs. Alastair is an associate with Arabs with over 13 years' experience as a structural engineer in the UK and Australia. He studied civil and architectural engineering at Bath University in the UK, and, he developed an, and there he developed an interesting interest in lightweight structures, undertaking his thesis on geodesic timber grid shells, which sounds fascinating. He, he began his structural career in London, working with Adam Cara Taylor, before relocating, relocating to Australia in 2006. He's worked with Arabs over the last 10 years in Sydney, Brisbane, and for a period established their Townsville office. Since moving to Brisbane, <coughs> Alex has been fortunate to manage and lead the structural design of key Queensland projects, including the Cairns Performing Arts Centre, the Gold Coast Cultural Precinct, and the State Velodrome, obviously. Please welcome Alistair and Alex to the stage. It's a bit small for two. <laughs> Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, some kind words. I gave you a lot of long words in that uh, spiel. I'm uh, <laughs> glad you got over them all. Uh, so thanks for the inv invitation to talk about the Anamir's Velodrome. Uh, and I think it probably does get the record for the shortest building in the tall building uh, breakfast seminar. Which is, we're very proud of that record. <laughs> it's still beautifully formed, as we know. Um, we, we're obviously uh, the architect and the engineer, uh, but we'd just like to acknowledge that there's an awful lot of people and time uh, that goes into making projects like this. Um, and we are going to acknowledge those people, but um, for now I'd like to also acknowledge people like me. <laughs> 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 I'd like to acknowledge uh, especially um, uh, the, the consultants we work with and also uh, Wattpack who are here today and sponsoring the event, uh, who I believe did an extremely important job uh, in actually delivering this building for the value that we, that we actually ended up with. Uh, an excellent job there. Um, <coughs> So we're going to talk to, uh, to you about how the project was developed, uh, loosely um, kind of through the kind of construction or design process, I guess. Uh, but prior to that, I'm just going to give a very quick word about our kind of association with Arup and, and Cox. Uh, it is one that's been gone on for a long time, and it probably started back in the days of Philip Cox and Tristram. And we've done projects together, um, certainly in the sports uh, field, like things like Amy Park and Adelaide Oval. So there's a, there's a long history here. Um, but this one we're particularly proud of being a Queensland project, and for our, certainly the Cox office in Brisbane, it was a very important project for us to do. Uh, and for that, we have to pay a lot of thanks to the client group for trusting us with this uh, and to deliver this, this kind of project. So thank you for that. Uh, just on the... Sorry. Very quickly, a sight of what we're going to talk about. Um, we're going to talk through the um, basic the brief it, um, and how that developed. Um, we're going to talk through the structural concepts and how we manage that brief through the structural design, um, following by the architectural concepts. Um, they're probably going to roll through fairly quickly into some of the detailed design elements that we in the talk. Uh, just trying to give you an idea of some of the principal um, elements that we did a lot of work on, for instance, the roof and the facade. Uh, it's very important, uh, the structural documentation, the architectural documentation, and we talked a little bit about computational design. It was a very important process in this project. Uh, I probably appreciate you're not all a big techie audience here, so we probably won't labour too much on that, but uh, it's nice to talk about these things, and so I'm very passionate about them. And then we're going to talk about the, the finishing of the building uh, and how it, how it stands now and, um, and the opening ceremonies. <coughs> so the, uh, the, the velodrome was conceived as an architectural competition, or certainly by the time we got hold of it. Um, and again, acknowledging there's probably a lot of work before, prior to that to actually get the project off the ground. But effectively, it's um, a competition that uh, brought the uh, Commonwealth Games to uh, the Gold Coast, or part of Brisbane in this case. Uh, and it also filled, filled a very strong need uh, for the cycling in, uh, 
community in Queensland. Um, it also uh, talks a lot about the development of the Sleemont Centre, which is a sporting complex on the outskirts of Brisbane, um, and how we actually manage that. The architectural brief, we'll talk a little bit about that, um, about all the kind of key design items, and then obviously the track, which is the, the glory item in this, in this building. So the architectural competition was a shortlisted competition, uh, and really it was about delivering uh, an international indoor track, uh, and that was the key thing. Um, but one of the most important things in these stadiums these days are the, the balance between legacy and overlay. Um, and I'll give you a quick def definition for those that don't know those terms. Uh, legacy is really what we provide, uh, the infrastructure we provide moving forward. Um, and basically, we have to design a building which is economically viable, functions well, and provides a community use uh, to, for on ongoing on the site. So when we use the term legacy, we're talking about what we're going to build for the future. Um, when, we, when, we use to, <coughs> when we use the term overlay, we're talking about things like the Commonwealth Games or the major games, um, and that's really all the infrastructure that we need to apply to these buildings in order to facilitate a game like that. The reason why we split those two things up, um, historically, or certainly going back probably before the uh, Olympic Games in Sydney, uh, a lot of infrastructure was built for purpose, which was to hold sport, sporting events. Um, There's a lot of capital expenditure. They basically built out the entire uh, development uh, for, for that one event and became very unviable. So a lot of thinking has been done in terms of how we make, it the, how we make these buildings efficient for cost and also viable. So that's really what, how this kind of legacy and overlay uh, thing developed. So the simple equation there is capital cost versus operational overlay cost. So we have to find a balance. So a lot of the work in pre-design is trying to find that balance between what we actually build for legacy and what we leave for overlay. Um, there were some very important discussions on this project. Um, see this beautiful picture. We had a very gloomy sort of uh, atmospheric thing going on when we first entered this competition. Um, I don't think this slide actually made it into the competition. I think the uh, PC uh, bike crash was <laughs> something that probably, <laughs> probably didn't fit the bill, but we quite liked it. Um, <clears throat> so, in terms of what we're doing for Sleeman, this is the, uh, the legacy we're going to leave Sleeman Centre, uh, or have left Sleeman Centre. Um, and one of the key aspects of the brief was how do we uh, facilitate a, a cycling centre, really. So we're trying to co-locate uh, a building for track cycling with the existing BMS, BMX tracks there. As you can see in the back kind of right corner of that building, that's the existing track, which was built for the uh, Commonwealth Games in two, uh, 1982, I think. And you can also see here that uh, whilst we've shown some uh, kind of master planning things on this drone, um, there was a lot of, it was a very bushland site, which is very important for the development of the design. So leaving the legacy for the Sleeman Centre, we're talking about how we can actually co-locate uh, bicycle functions and also perhaps build criterion tracks around, so really kind of bringing bring that centre up as a commercial entity. Um, the architectural brief, so really uh, these are the things that were kind of given to us, I guess, at the start, and they're very important. Um, I'll just read them out because it's kind of worth no no noting them. Uh, flexibility, very important, and that kind of ties into the overlay and legacy um, debate. Uh, community impacts, again, uh, trying to make sure it's not a, a white elephant, if you like. It's a building that will actually be used. Um, safety is very important. Cost effectiveness, we mentioned uh, the budget, which was, uh, we'd probably say tight. Um, we, we think we've got a lot of uh, capital out of that, uh, but we have to build to a budget. Everyone knows that. And local part participation, so we're talking about how we develop local industry and certainly choices of uh, contractors, uh, things like Beanley Steel, are very important, those things. As a brief overview, capacity, we had 1,500 permanent seats in the legacy. So when you walk into the building today, you'll see 1,500 seats. Uh, and then when you walk into the building, hopefully for the Commonwealth Games, you'll see 4,000 seats. And this is uh, talking about those legacy things. Uh, again, using the, uh, uh, the, the building for moving forward, we've designed in a uh, use from the infield for sports, uh, futsal in particular. And we can also build in uh, facilities for um, concerts. It's going to be designed that way. So more about the track. The track is a very interesting thing. We learned a lot about tracks. Um, we hadn't done tracks prior to this, and we just thought tracks were tracks, um, but that's not the case. Um, we had some strange conversations around uh, the word fat track and thin track, um, which I found a bit bizarre, but um, the, actually if you start talking to cyclists, and especially track builders, they're very passionate about the fatness of their track, if you like. Um, 
to explain what that means, uh, tracks aren't exactly the same everywhere you'd think they would be. You would think like a running track's exactly the same wherever you go, different finishes. But a, a cycling track's a completely different beast. It's designed principally to um, get people riding around as fast as they can um, and also to, to swing those riders around. So basically, create as much speed as you can around a circular track. So some little stuff there, 250 metres long. Um, it's got a pitch between uh, 15 degrees and 43 on the bend, so it's a pretty, pretty scary looking thing. And it's built from um, 40 by 40 mil battens uh, of Siberian spruce, all hand, hand constructed. And importantly, it's not symmetrical. It's a, it's, it's a very, uh, it's a piece of furniture effectively. As you come into one bend, it swings you around faster. When you leave the bend, it kind of lets you out a bit slower. So it's a very, very um, designed piece of structure. So I'm going to hand you over to Alistair, who is going to talk a little bit about uh, the structural concepts that came out of the brief and uh, how we developed the structure further. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, yeah, so the structural concepts that we developed during the design competition stage, uh, we, we considered quite a few things, including benchmarking, different design drivers to help develop the structural form uh, for the long span structure. Uh, so first looking at the, the benchmarking of recent velodromes around the world, uh, there's different ones for Commonwealth Games and uh, Olympic venues, and you can see from the, uh, the bar chart that we've got here that the budget that we had for the uh, Queensland State Velodrome was one of the lowest budgets of recent velodromes, uh, and it had one of the lower permanent capacities, however we did have that overlay capacity to be able to bump up the seats to 4,000 in overlay mode for major events. Uh, the other thing of interest looking at the uh, other venues around the world at the moment was to look at the different structural systems that were employed for each of them. So on the top right you've got uh, the London Olympic Velodrome, which was a cable net structure showing a uh, very big trust ring beam around the perimeter. Uh, second left from the top is uh, the Dunkray Velodrome in Sydney, which was a grid shell structure. And then bottom on the left is uh, from the Glasgow Commonwealth Games, which is basically uh, a big box with uh, big planar trusses. So the key design drivers uh, during the concept design for the structure were that uh, we needed to design for functional flexibility. So basically we needed to make sure that uh, the building was able to uh, accommodate the flexibility of either a fat or a thin track as uh, whilst we were designing we weren't quite sure which one it was going to be as it was a bit touch and go. Things Alex said, uh, we've ended up with a, a fat track uh, but it could have been a thin one at the time. Uh, so the, the facility is actually flexible, so it supports a wide range of legacy uses, indoor sports, entertainment events, sports medicine, headquarters cycle in Queensland, and with minor modifications, as we said, it can be expanded uh, for the Commonwealth Games uh, for the 4,000 seats overlay. Uh, in fact, we could even increase the capacity to 6,000 uh, in Olympic mode if really pushed. So the roof uh, framing system was actually made up of uh, planar radial trusses. Uh, this was selected for construction ease, uh, speed of construction and safety. And also uh, the other key consideration was uh, when working with the contractor, a collaborative approach to detail and to fast track the, uh, the design process. The other key consideration was uh, the budget and time constraints. Uh, the Veldrome needs to be finished by 2016, even though it wasn't going to be hosting its first major event to 2018. So that gave plenty of time for test events prior to major events. Uh, also, one of the considerations with uh, time was when the track installer was available to come and actually lay the track. So we needed to actually complete the velodrome, make it weather tight before they can come and install the timber track, which needs to be kept at a constant humidity while it was being installed. Uh, so it actually gets installed in the wet season while it's humid, so that when it dries out, uh, it shrinks away rather than popping the, the timbers. So the structural form. Uh, so we started off with a hyperbar hyperbolic paraboloid shaped roof, or a Pringle chip, uh, because this basically gave the minimum surface area for the roof and for the walls, uh, and actually allowed us to, to rake the seating up into the high points, so you still got uh, sight lines down onto the centre of the track and could actually see across the other side of the track. Uh, we've taken that uh, surface and used uh, parametric uh, form studies using Grasshopper and Geometry Gym to, to explore different uh, structural forms. So that allowed us uh, during the competition stage to quickly look at, so I think it was 12 different options we looked at, which considered cable nets, radial trusses, two-way grillages, two-way trusses, uh, grid shells, 
you name it, we, we can have looked at them all, but uh, using the parametrics, we're able to do that very, very quickly and uh, interrogate uh, steel tonnages, ease of construction, uh, to work out what was going to be the most suitable solution for the competition. Uh, most of the solutions we came up with weighed between about 40 and 70 kilos per square metre. And we finally settled on uh, the radial truss solution. Uh, basically, radial, truss, radial planar truss is connected by a central ring beam, uh, supported by a series of 20 perimeter columns, and that ended up being about 50 kilos per square metre. Uh, it wasn't the lightest solution, but it was going to be the easiest solution and cheapest solution to fabricate. Uh, so some of the dimensions that we've got there are the longest clear span in the north-south direction is 118 metres, 115 metres in the east-west direction, and it's 12 metres clear from the infield to the underside of the truss, uh, which uh, at its deepest point is 8 metres deep. And as you can see from the top right image, uh, it's actually large enough to house an A380. So Alex is now going to talk about the architectural concepts. Yeah, the A380 was pretty good. The only thing that stuck out the building was its tail, so I don't know where we're going to park it there, but it was pretty, pretty interesting how it actually, actually fit just over the track perfectly with all its engines. It was quite an incredible design, really. <laughs> anyway, so the architectural concepts, um, really um, talking about how we conceived this thing. Um, so connection to the landscape was a, was a big thing, um, which I'll talk about later. Um, operational orientation, so how we actually manage the, the building through the different uses, legacy and overlay. Uh, the stadium bowl we'll be talking about, um, really the architecture of the bowl and um, how we conceive those spaces, and then obviously the expression of structure, which is very important to us as architects. Um, so connection to the landscape, um, this, this building itself was uh, basically built into, a, into the topography. We had to dig out a huge amount of dirt to get a, what is effectively a very flat uh, plate building, a very large flat plate building, onto a very slopey site. So what that meant was we had to do a lot of excavation and it kind of lent itself to a design aesthetic where we were actually trying to slot this building into the landscape. Um, so it became a very important part of the architecture, how we, how we kind of conceived that and how we represented that in the, in the final design. And you can see this is, this has jumped on a little bit, this is actually a final image, but you can see from this, it's a very good image to, to, to show on the left there how, how the kind of berming worked. So we've got a lot of landscape treatment that came up around the building uh, and also continued a very heavy base around, which is all made out of blockwork or concrete then defined by a nice black kind of line on, on the balustrade. Then above that, we've got this, um, this kind of structure that sits over it, which is very different to it. So it was very trying, trying to isolate the two uh, aesthetics and make a very strong statement about that. The, the, white, um, the white went through a lot of iterations, to be honest with you, but I think the final um, kind of design on the white was to try and make a very striking form, um, which is completely uh, opposed to the natural landscape which I think if you're going to build on like this in the landscape, you can't really do much else with it. It's one of those things you have to deal with. So why not, make, why not celebrate that? Why not make a bit, bit of fun out of it and make a very striking form rather than just putting a, a big box? I'm sure what back probably appreciated all that, but <laughs> in the end, <laughs> Gary's shaking his head. <laughs> so the functional operation, we talked a little bit about um, how this building works in terms of an overlay and a legacy, uh, and this is very important. What, it actually allowed us, the, the slope of the site allowed us to do two things with this building, how we enter it. The, the plan on the left uh, is uh, what we call the concourse plan, and the plan on the right is what we call the ground floor plan. So starting with the plan on the right, um, you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, there's, I'll, I'll probably won't point to it, I can't see it, but there's a small little projection out of the building. That was the entry for the legacy use. So we, we kind of designed that as to be the everyday entry, uh, which is a very functional thing. As a cyclist or a football player, uh, or, or going to the gym even, this is where you'd enter the building. Um, it's expected of a very low use, really, in, in its legacy. Um, not many riders on, on the track at any given time, and probably about three football teams. So it's a very kind of low use relatively for the building size. Um, so we've got this entry down here, which we can manage our, our legacy with, and we've got reception, things like that, and we can get easy access to the changing rooms, and we can have a very functional kind of flow of, of, of space. On the left-hand side is the concourse level, and we're taking advantage here of the, uh, of the fill and the way the, the site works, and on the very left-hand side of that plan is our event entry. So we've got two completely different entries. So one, if you come into a large event, you come in uh, on the concourse level from the left, and if you come in as a, a, an athlete or a small event, you come in from the, from the bottom right. That allows us to split the flows very easily. So when we, have, when we are running a large event, or, or the operators are running a large event, there's a lot of options to actually split riders and public uh, and all the accreditation issues that we need to deal with. So I think in terms of planning, it was a very successful way of doing that. 
the, the stadium bowl, um, we, we talked a little bit about that, this kind of uh, white thing in the landscape. Um, it's a very dynamic form, uh, deliberately so. We, we wanted this to be the kind of glory shot, if you like. Um, Alistair mentioned a little bit about the parabolic forms, um, which uh, we really kind of form the whole, whole aesthetic of the whole thing. Um, but what we're trying to do with these, uh, there's a lot of uh, reason for this. It wasn't just a bit of architectural fancy. Um, to try and put height in the, uh, the sides of the track where we need the most seats. That gives you a bigger roof height through there, but also brings the roof down where you don't need the seats. Uh, it allows natural ventilation. The whole buildings can see without air conditioning. So the form of the roof gives a very natural stratification of air, which will come up to the underside of the roof and find its way out the eaves. They also, also uh, benefit really smoke extract. It wasn't really how we planned it, but one of those little nice little things that happen. So the form is very important. It's a very functional form, but it's also a very striking form. Um, expression structure, uh, Cox is a very strong exponent of expression structure and this particular building really warranted that. Uh, so all the way through the design we talked about with, with Arup, uh, how we're going to achieve these radial structures and how we're going to express them in the building. Uh, this this uh, shows part through the construction where we've got the actual main framing up uh, and part of the wall millions. And it gives a very good idea of how that shape is formed by structure and how it's expressed. Okay, so yeah, as I mentioned earlier, we uh, chose the radial truss solution, and I'll just take you through some of the structural principles of how that works, and then a bit about the uh, roof cladding. So as mentioned, it's the radial truss solution, and uh, primarily it works in arching action in the north-south direction, and catenary in the east-west direction, uh, with the arch shown by blue and catenary shown by the, the green in this image here. Uh, the catenary action is resistant to retention and tie-downs around the perimeter, and pre-stress introducing this tie down to ensure that it doesn't become slack under service load combinations. Uh, the thrust of the arch in the north-south direction is resolved through a push-pull through the raking columns and vertical uh, prop couples, and the system is restrained by the inner oculus and outer ring beams. Uh, the movement joints at quarter points around the roof in the, the bracing elements uh, to allow for thermal movements and uh, prevent build-up of uh, stresses. Uh, just for some quick numbers on it, there's about uh, Three, three and a half uh, meganewtons of uh, tension in the, the cords and up to four meganewtons in the cords as well in compression. Uh, we, we took this uh, design, actually we optimised it using uh, parametric design skills and uh, our in-house software, uh, basically looking at different uh, options for it, you know, straight, curved, faster truss members, looking at deepening the truss uh, at the column truss interfaces, looking at all the bottom cords being cables, bottom cords being CHSs, uh, multiple studies that we did uh, to come up with the optimum structural solution. One of the key drivers that we had uh, was to make it a construction-led approach and to try and make it a buildable solution. Uh, so we worked in collaboration with uh, the contractor, the, uh, the steel fabricator, the shop detailer and the temporary works engineer from very early on in the design stage to come up with a system of, if you call it, a kit of parts so that uh, the, the whole system could be fabricated off-site brought to site in as big a piece as possible and then assembled in the quickest time possible. Uh, as I said, you know, the radial truss solution is planar truss, so it makes it fairly simple to fabricate. Uh, and as you can see from the images on the screen here, uh, it was a fairly logical sort of assembly of, uh, of parts. Uh, what should be noted actually with uh, the shape of the roof is that it's symmetrical about the two axes, the north, south and east, west axes. So actually it's only really a quarter model that you need to consider. There's actually only five different trusses used on the whole project which are then replicated around the perimeter at each of the main uh, column locations. So once we'd uh, designed the, the roof steel, that then needed to be uh, restrained and landed down onto the concrete concourse. Uh, so we had a, a series of perimeter columns, so we had 20 columns inclined on the major grids. We also had intermediate uh, mullions which were picking up the facades, uh, and they were 40 of them, so 60 columns in total for supporting the roof. Uh, they were then landed down onto uh, the concourse via some uh, heavily reinforced plinths and connected using clevis pin connections, which I'll talk about a bit later. Uh, the lateral forces from those columns are then resisted by a series of concrete shear walls on each of the major grids and stability loads taken through diaphragm action of the concourse slab to share the loads between each of those, which are then taken down into the pile caps and piles. 
So as mentioned, uh, the concourse uh, is a uh, flat slab. It's six and a half thousand square metres of suspended concrete done out of traditional reinforced concrete with reinforcement laid regularly. Uh, there's actually construction or sort of movement joints at quarter points in the structure there to allow for, for movement. Uh, the other concrete elements that we had were the, the pods, uh, which Alex mentioned previously, which uh, is the sort of main entrance for the, the tenancy spaces and ancillary uses. Uh, if you look at the image there, I mean, I don't think it was planned this way, but you do look at it from plan and it ends up looking like a big queue for Queensland's, but uh, I think that was by luck rather than planning. Uh, and yeah, just the, the other one I've got up there is uh, the seating plats. Uh, as Alex mentioned earlier, the, the track isn't symmetrical, and that means the seating isn't symmetrical, and the seating is uh, constantly varying all the way around the track. Uh, and that was a bit of a bit of a secret that the track designer was keeping up his sleeve because he uh, owns the IP to that, and it's all parametric driven, and he wouldn't let us have that information until very late on. Uh, but because of the random sort of nature of it, meant that it uh, didn't really lend itself to prefabrication and precast, so all those seating tiers were all cast in situ. So moving on to the cladding, uh, so the, the geometry of the roof was developed to suit metal deck cladding where flat grades and large radius curves were readily achievable. Uh, the cladding system revised to a fabric system during the detailed design to suit client and contractor preference. However, this did bring about some engineering challenges which we had to work through with the design team. Uh, so looking at the, the fabric solution, uh, we had to make sure that there was enough curvature in the roof uh, to, to, to limit ponding effects on uh, the roof. And say with uh, the arching action in north-south direction, water sheds in north-south direction to uh, some large box gutters, which uh, has got siphonic drainage in. Uh, other considerations were that we were looking to use fabric uh, with a, enough opacity to reduce the energy consumption uh, of lights during the day. Uh, so we did some daylight studies on that. Uh, but probably the, the most important one with the fabric and actually for the design of the structure was the wind engineering, which we had to undertake. So uh, being a structure that's over 100 metres long, uh, we can't use a codified approach to uh, looking at the wind loads. And so we actually uh, did some wind tunnel testing, which uh, brought up some surprisingly higher loads than uh, we expected. Uh, you can probably just about see on the, the wind tunnel testing model there on the right hand side, there's a bit of a slope there, which is actually faces the BMX track, which is uh, the berm or landscape berm. And that actually accelerated the wind loads up that berm and actually uh, created some, some larger than expected uh, gusts of, I think it was about five and a half kPa that we ended up looking at in that situation. Uh, so looking at the wind loads, uh, what we actually had to, the higher than expected local wind uplift pressures that we ended up getting results in large in-plane forces that combined with outer balance in-plane fabric forces, which was high as 50 kilonewtons a meter in some scenarios, ended up uh, with the PTFE fabric working fairly close to its limit. Uh, just so that we uh, didn't end up with any structural failure, we worked with uh, the fabric consultants to develop connections of the fabric to the, to the primary structure so that they would form plastic hinges in the event of some fabric failure so that if you did get fabric failure, you didn't pull the primary structure down and you could then come back and just replace a single panel of fabric. So that kind of leads into the fabric walls that Alex will talk about. Just before going to the facade, I think it's a really important point to just draw that again, that the, the, the building wasn't designed originally as a fabric roof, it was designed as a metal roof, uh, and it was a contractor-led decision, which everyone supported to go to fabric, and obviously had a lot of commercial work in that, but the real benefit of that really was the natural daylight. Um, it obviously helps uh, riders ride throughout the day in, in training mode and also competition mode and probably most of the time in, uh, for, for cameras as well. Um, it was a real benefit to the project, and I think it's a real benefit going forward for the legacy. Uh, and I think also it looks beautiful, which is what I'm obviously very passionate about as well. Uh, so I think that was a really good move that we got in that. The uh, architecture of the facade, so really, um, this is obviously quite a key architectural element on this building. Um, and we'd, we've got a few kind of uh, things that are important on this. One is the materials. Uh, secondly, the fabric form finding in the facade and the eaves design, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the computational, computational design process that we use to uh, try and find those forms. So when the building started off in its uh, early stages, um, we had a, a damper on facade, um, originally just trying to reduce cost and try and keep it as minimal as we can. Um, we probably found that the, the form itself uh, didn't really lend itself very well to that kind of uh, system, given the geometries that were implied in, the, in those uh, shapes. 
So it kind of developed into an aluminium system for a while. It's, these projects do a lot of this kind of thing, whether we could sheave the aluminium, whether we could like lay it as like a shingle almost um, to try and get a standardised form. We did a lot of work on trying to find a, a very simple standardised system that would actually lend itself to this geometry. Um, as it turns out, fabric was the answer. I think fabric was a very good answer in this particular case as well. Um, because obviously it does naturally allow form finding or form twisting, depending on how you apply it to a structure. So those two images kind of show how the development of that uh, and how it, how it all worked. Um, and, and here's kind of how we kind of established those forms, if you like, um, and again, through a lot of computational design process to try and set a form uh, which was very reminiscent of a track, very sweeping form. And I would actually generate that into a piece of architecture, uh, which is the top one. Uh, the, the kind of bottom ones are then trying to divide that into a series of um, bays, if you like, which can be removed. So the, the whole system, fabric system can be taken off. Uh, as Alistair mentioned very early on, uh, there's an option to expand this building out to a, a larger capacity by taking the fabric facade off. So we have to think about that, how that would work. And then the final one is really uh, a, a way of, uh, an architectural way, if you like, of trying to press some form into this structure to try and make a dynamic shape but also to try and keep it uh, relatively simple. So it's single stick lines, but they are twisted. It took a lot of work on, on this, to be fair. It probably was a bit more complicated than we first thought it would be. Um, and a lot of credit goes to um, uh, Mac Max and uh, Wapak and the structural drafters, uh, online drafting, to really kind of achieve that. But I think what we have achieved is, is pretty impressive. Um, so this is um, a little video we made, um, just to show you what we're trying to achieve with the form. And you can see from that, trying to get that light balance across, across, the, um, across the facade during different times of the day. So rather than like putting pattern on the facade, we're actually trying to do that with light and shade uh, and doing that in structure, which, which I think worked quite well. Uh, the eaves design. So the eaves was a very important part of this uh, aesthetic. Uh, it's a very large structure. Um, we wanted this to be a big disc in the landscape, uh, sat on top, so it's like the cap, if you like. It's a very strong structure. Um, it went through a lot of different... Um, options if you like uh, and we settled on a on a basically a very simple well, I'm going to say simple it's a simple geometry that forms a very complicated shape which is a hyperbolic shape uh, as you can see from the details here uh, it's quite a complicated thing um, and we also designed a lot of that to to be prefabricated um, so we could lift it up into place um, you can also see that it's all flat uh, or flat sections and there's a lot of thought went into how we kind of engineer those flat sections and the pitches we do to make a very gracious curve around the building and also how we generate uh, space and opportunity within that structure to run our drainage and hide all the services. So what we ended up with is what I think is a very clean looking eaves detail uh, with all the nuts and bolts if you like um, hidden which is really important. It caused me a lot of stress I must admit, um, a lot of late nights worrying about whether it would work or not. Um, I'm sure it caused, caused the engineers and the builders just as much stress, but we got there. I think it worked. <laughs> um, so really, a little bit on the computation design. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much of the technical stuff, but uh, you can see that we use a lot of si these systems which generate a lot of models very quickly. And the reason we do that as architects and engineers, but especially as architects, uh, is, is to allow us to study a lot of forms very quickly, especially in these complex shapes. Uh, it allows us to uh, look, look at a lot of different options. So when we are looking at with different ways of putting a facade together or different ways of uh, treating steel or d even different sizes of building, we can do it very quickly uh, as long as we set up all the parameters properly. Uh, and the advantage of that is we can test uh, ideas that are given to us, either driven by cost or driven by design, uh, and we can test them very quickly. We can test them for areas. We can test them for uh, rates. We can test them for visual impression that we've got. So uh, as an architect, I'm, I'm very passionate about that, and I'll probably talk about that for about five hours, um, but I won't today, thankfully. Um, but it's an extremely important process to develop these kind of buildings. Uh, again here, so this is quite, uh, I've just picked out one little uh, scenario. We did lots of studies here, but this is one in particular where we took the uh, design wireframe, uh, which we generated, um, which led straight into the structural programs, which also led straight into the drafting programs for the detailer. But in this particular one, we wrote a code that uh, actually uh, apply the, the uh, pre camber into the into the wireframe, um, which I must admit took about an hour to do, and it was great because every time we flexed that whole design or changed something, we got the uh, the design state and the pre cambered state immediately out of the process. So we can always work with the two systems very easily, and we didn't have to get confused or didn't miss one in one and not put it in the other. It was a very kind of good process, and it allowed us to give the shop drawer uh, the pre cambered model, and then us keep the kind of final state model in there.
Okay, as, uh, as Alex mentioned, uh, we used a center line geometry model that was driven from the parametric script. Uh, we were able to basically take that straight into our analysis package and push that from there straight into documentation uh, and round trip that every time we had updates. So we actually uh, just had a single model uh, rather than having to do an analysis model and a documentation model. Uh, so that process was very quick and efficient and as I say, we were able to, to test different things very quickly and document them very quickly based on that. Uh, that then also leads into uh, the, the steel detailing. Uh, so we had weekly uh, steel detailer meetings with the contractor, steel fabricator and shop detailer. Uh, to fast track the process and to design things that were uh, easy to fabricate, quick to fabricate and going to be economic while still maintaining an aesthetic. Uh, that, that process worked very well, you know, we didn't need to have a formal RFI process and we answered uh, the issues on the spot and I think it uh, nut out a lot of the problems with all the design team in the same room at the same time. So moving on to the steel fabrication and erection. Uh, as I said, we worked collaboratively with uh, the steel fabricator, temporary works engineer, uh, and the, the contractor to, to work out uh, what the, the erection sequence for the, the project was going to be, what the construction details were going to be, and uh, how big we were going to make the elements for fabrication, transport, and assembly. So looking at the, the erection sequence, uh, during the competition phase we actually proposed uh, a sequence for the erection of the, the velodrome. However, there was a temporary works engineer engaged by Wattpack uh, Construct, and uh, Rob Tees came up with, uh, with a erection methodology, which is pretty similar to, to what we proposed originally, uh, which limited the locked-in stresses. So we started off with uh, nine tower crane bases in the centre to erect the major north-south components of the oculus, followed by completing the oculus, then using uh, mobile uh, tower crane bases to, to extend those north-south and east-west trusses, sand the columns and complete those trusses. Uh, then the bolted bracing uh, in the roof plane was then put in place to stabilize uh, that system. And then all the remaining infill radial trusses were put in place and then completed with uh, the ring beam and uh, W bracing around the perimeter. So in all there was a total of 12 tower crane bases used, three, three mobile and nine fixed. And uh, through this system uh, we minimized uh, locked in stresses so as mentioned, uh, the connection design was also driven uh, through the construction lab process with the contractor and the steelworks subcontractor. Uh, we had large trusses which uh, were spanning you know, up to 50 metres and obviously they wouldn't be transportable so we needed to come up with splice details which would allow them to transport them in manageable sections. Uh, so it was a contractor preference to use a cradle connection rather than a site butt weld to do the full moment uh, connections. Uh, that principle was that you know you had one one half of the cradle, you could lay the other half of the truss in it, and then do site fillet welds to to gain enough length of welds to to replicate the, the full strength butt welds, and that system worked very well. Uh, looking at the connection on the right hand side, that's actually uh, one of the cleverest pin connections at the knuckles at the top of the column, where we had inclined columns meeting with uh, the compression struts or the, the the props to support the ring beam. Uh, in some instances we had pins of up to 165 millimetres diameter and plate thicknesses of up to 120 mil thickness uh, just so that we could uh, you know, uh, maintain an aesthetic appearance on some of those and to hide stiffeners beneath the eaves details because we didn't want uh, bits of plate hanging out in those locations. So again going to the, to the fabrication and uh, looking at the, the size of the pieces that could be fabricated uh, the maximum size that we had was a 21 metre long by 8 metre wide truss section uh, and it was actually so big that the fabrication yards needed to shift the gate posts to actually get them out of the yard. Uh, so there was actually over 200 vehicle movements to site with uh, the fabricated pieces and 40 of those were with police escorts and actually uh, with the larger pieces uh, the, the flatbeds were followed by a mobile crane just in case uh, they needed to pick the truss up as it went around corners uh, in case it had fallen off. So looking at uh, the assembly on site, uh, it all went pretty much to plan in terms of uh, what, we'd, what the temporary works engineer had devised in terms of the erection methodology. Uh, the primary steel work took about four months to erect in total, uh, and there were four mobile cranes used for erection range between 20 tonnes and 200 tonnes. So uh, D-Day, or D-Propping Day as I like to call it, 
Uh, this is always a bit of a nervous time, especially for a long span structure, but it's a bit of an anticlimax because on something that's measuring 118 metres, you know, the, the deflection that you get once you deprop is pretty minimal. You, you can't see a thing happening. It took uh, four hours for them to simultaneously uh, release the bottle jacks uh, to, to deprop the structure. And uh, we actually had uh, a bit of a wager within the design team about uh, how much it was going to deflect under self-weight. And I think Alex was uh, correct there. Or well, nearest by one millimeter, it's actually deflected 176 millimeters, and our analysis had it at 180 millimeters. So it's pretty spot on. I did actually want to get a slide in here from the surveyors who actually took some drone shots and uh, surveyed the whole thing uh, from the sky and just overlay that with uh, the model, but it didn't quite happen in time. Uh, I think, as Alex mentioned earlier, there was a pre camber of 200 mil, uh, which was built into the design. So what we did is we actually designed, put the pre camber in to take out the self weight deflections. So we were basically a little bit up, we we're 20, 24 mil higher than uh, what we'd originally designed it as, but as soon as you put some of the superimposed dead loads on, that was fine. So here's just a quick video of uh, the erection sequence. I might cut this short, uh, but it's quite good to see the first part of it. Um, it gives you a really good sense of how the building went together. Um, so I'll, I'll just kind of let you watch it for a minute and I'll move it on. Maybe you won't watch that. Anyway, it, it was great. It worked. <laughs> you can get it on the government website. Yeah, you can get it on the government web website. You're correct. Um, so this is now not working whatsoever. Oh, that's bigger. move on there but if you want to watch the rest of that it goes on for about another two minutes and you can get it on the, on the government website it is actually really worth watching but we're a little bit behind time already so I'm going to keep going um, so this is finishing this off really so this is how we um, or the completion of the building if you like um, I'm going to talk a bit about the final track construction and uh, also the opening which was great and you can see Anna Maria is there which was uh, it was great to see her uh, on the track and it was actually her first ride on a, on a track since she retired um, so she was very excited by that and we were excited to see her there um, it was a great day. Uh, there was an interesting story about fire alarms, so I'm sure we'll hear about that another day. I think Anthony will tell you that one later on. <laughs> the track construction, very quickly. Um, so that, as we talked about before, it's a very bespoke piece of furniture. Uh, it's all prefabricated, uh, all the trusses are prefabricated to all the angles and the grades. Uh, they're installed by a lot of Germans that come over um, and hammer things together with hammers. Um, I'm not going to make any... Um, discussion of what they wear when they're doing that, but um, you can probably imagine um, getting in trouble for those kind of things. But it's a beautiful sight, seeing 20 guys smashing bits of timber together, and because of the reverberance in the stadium at the time, it was very kind of Disney-like, there was a lot of people with hammers and noises going on, like a, it was a beautiful thing. The track itself is very beautiful. Um, we have shown, uh, if you ever go to the velodrome and you go into the main entry, you'll be able to see the track structure through one of the little windows we provided. I think that's really worth it, because a lot of this beautiful structure and craftsmanship is otherwise hidden, so... I'll move on quickly. So, so just some final images. Um, of, I'll just flick through them to be honest with you. But this is um, one of the, I think it was the Junior Championships, Queensland Junior Championships. And you can see uh, in, in this particular image, you can see the daylight in the roof, which I think was really important for us. It's a very bright looking thing. The structure is really clear and expressed. It looks very clean. Um, a lot of Belgians I've been to have uh, solid roofs and purlins. They look very heavy and grey. So we were really pleased with how this came out. Um, the kind of uh, action shot going on there around the bends. Uh, this is how we kind of was well, a very early morning shot. Um, again, just sort of picking it all up. And finally, the uh, going back to how we originally conceived it uh, with the co-location of the building and the uh, cycling events on the outside. So I think it's quite an expressive piece of architecture. So we're all very proud of it, and um, hope you've enjoyed listening to us talk about it. Uh, there's a few acknowledgements if you'd like to make. I might let Alice to make those. Um, 
You won't? Okay, so well, <laughs> we'll keep going. Uh, we've put in for a few awards. We won the National uh, Engineering Award for the Steel, uh, which is very exciting, and we've put in for a few other awards, so hopefully we'll go well with those. Um, but really, at the end of the day, it's about hearing the feedback from the cyclists and the people that use the building. I personally went to uh, the National Tra Championships a couple of weekends ago, and I was very excited to hear how Queensland Cycling uh, received the building. It really makes, makes my day worthwhile, I kind of think. Uh, and that's us, so we've uh, tactically given you no time for questions. <laughs> that's, that's not true, we've got plenty of time for questions. Um, so if you'd like to ask anything uh, of either of us, um, go ahead. Um, and if not, we'll thank you for listening. Okay, uh, I, probably, I probably did gloss over that slightly, but uh, the, the track itself uh, is the same width all the way around, so in this instance about 7.1 metres, so even though the geometry does change and it rotates, uh, a linear measure, perpendicular surface, will be the same length all the way around. So the fat and thin bit comes about the radius of the bend, really, so if it's a very tight radius at the end, uh, it's a longer track, so you, have, you still have to maintain the 250 metres uh, linear length. So if you squash the sides in, it obviously makes your track longer and it makes your bends tighter. So we understand, uh, I'm not a cyclist, so I apologise to people that are, and I get this wrong, but I understand it, on a thin track, it's got a much uh, tighter curve on the bend, so it gives the sprinters a lot of chance to actually come down that bend really fast and just kick off that bend. Uh, the track that was chosen by uh, Cycling Australia is, is the fat track in this particular building, so that's a much wider track. It's got more gentle bends, uh, and it's probably more suited to uh, people training how to ride on tracks. So that's why they chose that particular track in this instance. Um, and interestingly enough, when I was talking to Cycling Queensland uh, at the event, they, uh, a lot of the riders had actually been found out, especially in the sprints. They were trying to uh, get on the, on the shoulder of the rider in front like they do, and they were trying to kick off the bend. But what they found was, because the track wasn't built that way, they were struggling to actually get off, get around the track or get around the rider in front. So, it was a very so they learned a lot about the tactics on how to ride this kind of track as opposed to a thin track, uh, which obviously put in good stead when it comes to the Commonwealth Games and they've got a home track advantage, which is really what we're all about. I'm, I'm, I'm English, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, good luck, good luck, Australia. Uh, <laughs> Anyone else? Did Diane see a question? Yeah. Yep. What about the translucency of the wall surface? Yeah. Fabric? Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Yeah. That's a good question. So, uh, the, the it's really comes down to broadcast, um, and because the cameras in a, in a velodrome have to kind of look across the track, um, it, it was important for them, the broadcasters, not to have uh, any, any glare or light coming through uh, on the other end of the, of the shot, if you like. So we, we, have, uh, we, we went to an opaque fabric for that very reason. Um, we got enough light in the day look studies in the, in the roof that really kind of gave us what we needed. Uh, we did, uh, because it's a legacy building as well, it's not all about the games, it's not all about a big event. We, we do have a lot of uh, glazing in the quadrants, we call them, um, but the idea is they can be constructed, so they can be blacked out very easily. Whereas if you did a whole facade with translucency, it's very difficult to do that. So there's still a, a technical question about how they black out the roof if they wish to do that. Uh, that'll be up to them to work out. <laughs> any more? Any structural ones? <laughs> Loads of engineers, I can see you. <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, Wattpac are proud to be uh, sponsors of this morning's breakfast and equally proud to be involved in the Animeers Velodrome. Uh, this morning we heard presentations from both uh, Alex and uh, Alastair and uh, they were an integral part in the success of that project along with several of the other consultants who are here this morning. Uh, we lived and breathed that project for two and a bit years, our uh, site team mostly here. And uh, I think there were a few heartaches and headaches throughout the job, but uh, we got through it at the end. And I learned a few things about that uh, project that, uh, from this morning's presentation. Um, and by the way, uh, Anna Mears wasn't the first to ride on that. Uh... <laughs> you, uh, I think it was one of our, uh, our guys, wasn't it? <laughs> who, who was testing the uh, timing equipment. Uh, uh, it mightn't be considered a uh, tall building, but it's certainly an iconic building. And it's one that uh, each of the guys involved and women involved in the 
uh, construction team and design team will probably say, we'll never do another one of those in our lifetime. So it's a truly wonderful facility and if you haven't seen it already, you, I encourage you to get out there and have a look at it um, and hopefully witness some uh, uh, rare sporting achievements in the next 12 months. So on behalf of Wattpac, I'd just like to pass on a vote of thanks to uh, uh, Alex and also to Alistair for their uh, in informative presentation this morning. Thank you, guys. Look at that, on time yet again. Well done, guys. It's always hard to keep these things. We're always so passionate about it on time, but they've done a, done a great job. Fantastic presentation, an amazing, amazing building. Um, thanks again. So just the last reminder is here in two months' time, roughly on the Thursday, the 25th of May, we'll be talking about the uh, Hurston Quarter Master Plan with, uh, with Hassels. Um, have a great day, guys, and thanks for coming again. Cheers.